Okay, so this is a continuation, actually, of Section 5.7, the surface of Mars. Uh, where we left off here was at the polar caps of Mars. You see one of them there in the picture. And uh, I'd said earlier in the chapter, one big thing to remember, one huge difference between um, Earth's polar caps and Mars. When you think of the Martian caps, think first of frozen carbon dioxide. Think of dry ice. That's really what you're looking at in the pictures. There is a layer of regular ice underneath. Now, that dry ice is seasonal. Because it doesn't take much heat at all for dry ice to become a gas. And remember, it does sublimate. It goes directly from a solid to a gas. That's sublimation. Great example in nature of it uh, on Mars, especially the southern cap. The southern cap has a lot of dry ice, and uh, it's only about a meter thick, as you can see. But that's enough. It's spread out over a big enough area that when it does sublimate, it changes the atmosphere. This is pretty incredible. The atmosphere actually gets 30%. Uh, the atmospheric pressure changes by 30 percent um that's huge that's like its own little mini uh global warming then and so it's the southern summers on mars when you have weather when you have the most um you know winds and dust storms and things like that uh during the southern summer on mars very interesting stuff now unlike the movies uh the winds on mars yeah they can be fast but the, the, the atmosphere is so thin that, that it's not going to knock you over or anything like that. It's not like a tornado uh, on the Earth. Uh, so they usually portray that uh, pretty badly in movies. Uh, here's the northern cap, which is actually mostly regular ice. But again, it has that thin layer of dry ice over the top. And uh, that, that regular ice is what we call a residual cap. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Mars, at the poles anyway, is never going to be warm enough for ice, regular ice, to melt. And so it's a residual cap. It's going to stay there uh, permanently. All right, enough of that. Let's get to some good stuff here. Let's talk about um, landing on Mars. All the times, all the missions to Mars. There are so many of them. Um, I just kind of have to pick and choose some of my favorites, okay? But let's go back to the original when I was a little kid, the Viking missions. This was so, so exciting. I was five years old uh, when we landed on Mars, and I always think that's one of the main reasons I got into astronomy, actually, um, being so excited about us landing on Mars. Um, you actually can see the difference. It's kind of interesting. The picture on the left, as we already mentioned, the color of Mars is due to iron oxide or rust. Uh, we already mentioned that. Well, if you look on the left, that, those are the first pictures that came back from Vikings showing a very red planet appropriately. Well, it's really not that red. The picture on the right is more of a true color picture that was taken in the 1990s. Uh, why is that? Well, maybe maybe NASA was playing to the crowd a little bit um, and purposely made those pictures come out a little bit more reddish and a pinkish sky and all that. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, when you see those super red pictures from back in the 70s, uh, that's not correct. Uh, the color on those was wrong. But still, they were amazing missions, very expensive missions. And um, But we successfully landed both of them on Mars. Pretty amazing. Now, okay, I have to show you this very quickly. One of the things that came out of those missions uh, from the orbiter part of it was this picture right here. And uh, this caused NASA a lot of consternation. I wish they, they, they probably wish that they'd never released this picture. Uh, the famous face on Mars, uh, the shadows making it look like a face. And keep in mind, as a little kid, I thought this was like some little mask or something in the soil. But this is actually many miles across is the first thing you need to know. And the second thing you need to know is that when we flew by in the 1990s over the face, I mean, NASA was really sick of answering questions about it. And finally, they flew over it again and showed that without those particular shadows, it's just a series of hills. Nothing uh, nothing to see here. So anyway, one of my favorite missions, sentimentally, is uh, one that landed in 1997. Think about that. We had not been, we hadn't landed on Mars um, in 22 years. So I was a kindergartner the first time uh, in 1976. And then we didn't land again until I was a high school teacher. So, um, and I was very interested in Mars and to wait that long was, was rough. And so we landed on July 4th, 1997, and it was our first rover. Those Viking missions couldn't go anywhere, but the first rover, really cool Pathfinder mission. And, um, that was the one that landed uh, we watched this in class, kind of like a bubble wrap method where the last, 
uh, bit. They actually just dropped it, and the thing bounced like 10 stories. It was really cool. Um, so they went to an outflow channel, a place where there had been flooding long ago. And this was part of NASA's faster, better, cheaper mantra of the 90s. That didn't work out so well. It did in this case. Uh, but in 99 and 2001, they had really disastrous missions that did not go so well. So it was a, a mixed bag on that. Anyway, there's a little rover pulling up next to a rock called Yogi. All right, so that method, the bubble wrap method, worked well. As I mentioned, there were terrible missions in 1999, I think, was the one that that literally missed the planet. Yeah, they, they missed it. And, and the reason why is that they used the wrong units. One team is using, you know, metric units, and the other team is using the English units. And, uh, yeah, anyway, very, very embarrassing. 2001, they had one, the Mars Polar Lander. I was very excited about that. That actually crashed right into the pole. Shoot didn't open. So they needed a win. And by 2004 and early 2005, they got a double win with Spirit and Opportunity. They actually hit a hole in one Gusev crater. I remember that, the Spirit rover. These also landed with the kind of bouncing bubble wrap method. Terrific missions if you want to read up about them. Opportunity there landed near this very interesting crater, Victoria Crater. And, uh, Great, great missions. Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter from 2006. This is amazing. They're actually, it, the, um, the camera on that is so amazing that they can actually see the rover sitting on the surface. Uh, it's just unbelievable. Really cool stuff. Um, and then 2008, and you'll notice the trend that every two years we go. That's when uh, Mars set opposition and we send things. Phoenix Lander was pretty exciting. You see, ooh, that's cool. Look at um, Olympus Mons there. Look how far north we landed with Phoenix. Beautiful picture as it was landing there, this big canyon there. And um, anyway, it landed in a very flat area. Why? Because that's where there was an ocean. So billions of years ago, that's where the ocean of Mars was located. And what they were looking for was ice to see if there's still ice there under the surface, which they thought. So it had a scoop and they didn't even need the scoop because underneath the actual rover, the um, the retro rockets, that one landed old school. They landed with retro rockets, and it uh, actually uncovered the ice for them. But then later on, they were digging it up as well. So that was uh, a great mission. Uh, they missed, if I remember right, the 2010 window because Curiosity wasn't ready. Uh, so they got there in 2012. You see how big it is compared to those people there. I mean, that's that's insane. So much larger than, like, the little Pathfinder. You could hold that in your hands. Um and uh, if you're not familiar with the landing, definitely uh, check this out on YouTube, the entry, descent, and landing, the sky crane maneuver that they did. We watch a video on it in class, and um, just amazing. I mean, I just, I'm just i just blown away by the engineering that was involved in that. They call it seven minutes of terror because they do not know, once they get the signal that it is, you know, touched the top of the atmosphere, they know at that moment already because of the time delay uh, – that it's on the surface one way or the other. It's either in pieces where it crashed or it's landed safely, and they don't they don't know. Um, seven minutes of terror. Interesting. There's uh, the Curiosity rover doing a selfie. Just gorgeous. Look at that. I mean, it might as well be again out out west somewhere, out in Utah, New Mexico. It's just just gorgeous. Look at the landscape. Really fascinating. Um, a couple more missions here, 2014. This one maybe is not as famous, but uh, I was excited about this. MAVEN was studying the atmosphere um, of uh, Mars. And then um, coming up, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. We have in 2018 is, um, I didn't put that in the slide for some reason, but 2018 we have one called Mars Insight. It was in the notes earlier that's going to study interior Mars. And then Mars 2020, the year 2020 seems to be a really big year for Mars. Everybody's going. The United States is sending uh, another rover, uh, very, very similar to Curiosity. Um, uh, Russia's going, and, and I think in conjunction with the European Space Agency, and China supposedly has a rover going to Mars, their first rover uh, all in 2020. Sounds like a really busy, exciting year for Mars. And you see there, you know, the, as the computers get better and better, they're going to start doing more autonomous stuff. I think that's what it's showing here is that the computer will make some real-time decisions on where it's going to land, uh, which is amazing, amazing stuff. So all kinds of good stuff coming up with Mars. And uh, I think I'll save this, uh, the atmosphere for the next lecture. Thanks for listening.